Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Letters. Letter 1. St. Petersburg, December 11th, at an undisclosed time in the 1700s. To Mrs. Seville, England. You will rejoice to hear that no disaster has accompanied the commencement of an enterprise which you have regarded with such evil forebodings. I arrived here yesterday, and my first task is to assure my dear sister of my welfare and increasing confidence in the success of my undertaking. I am already far north of London, and as I walk in the streets of Petersburg, I feel a cold northern breeze play upon my cheeks, which braces my nerves and fills me with delight. Do you understand this feeling? This breeze, which has travelled from the regions towards which I am advancing, gives me a foretaste of those icy climes. Inspirited by this wind of promise, my daydreams become more fervent and vivid. I try in vain to be persuaded that the pole is the seat of frost and desolation. It ever presents itself to my imagination as the region of beauty and delight. There, Margaret, the sun is forever visible, its broad disk just skirting the horizon and diffusing a perpetual splendor. There, for with your leave, my sister, I will put some trust in preceding navigators, there snow and frost are banished, and— Sailing over a calm sea, we may be wafted to a land surpassing in wonders and in beauty every region hitherto discovered on the habitable globe. Its productions and features may be without example, as the phenomena of the heavenly bodies undoubtedly are in these undiscovered solitudes. What may not be expected in a country of eternal light? I may there discover the wondrous power which attracts the needle, and may regulate a thousand celestial observations that require only this voyage to render their seeming eccentricities consistent for ever. I shall satiate my ardent curiosity with the sight of a part of the world never before visited, and may tread a land never before imprinted by the foot of man. These are my enticements, and they are sufficient to conquer all fear of danger or death, and to induce me to commence this laborious voyage with the joy a child feels when he embarks in a little boat with his holiday mates on an expedition of discovery up his native river. But, supposing all these conjectures to be false, you cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind, the last generation, by discovering a passage near the pole to these countries to reach which at present so many months are requisite, or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be effected by an undertaking such as mine. These reflections have dispelled the agitation with which I began my letter, and I feel my heart glow with an enthusiasm which elevates me to heaven, for nothing contributes so much to tranquillize the mind as a steady purpose, a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual eye. This expedition has been the favorite dream of my early years. I have read with ardor the accounts of the various voyages which have been made in the prospect of arriving at the North Pacific Ocean, through the seas which surround the Pole. You may remember that a history of all the voyages made for purposes of discovery composed the whole of our good Uncle Thomas' library. My education was neglected, yet I was passionately fond of reading. These volumes were my study day and night and my familiarity with them increased that regret which I had felt as a child on learning that my father's dying injunction had forbidden my uncle to allow me to embark in a seafaring life. These visions faded when I perused for the first time those poets whose effusions entranced my soul and lifted it to heaven. I also became a poet, and for one year lived in a paradise of my own creation. I imagined that I might also obtain a niche in the temple where the names of Homer and Shakespeare are consecrated. You are well acquainted with my failure and how heavily I bore the disappointment, but just at that time I inherited the fortune of my cousin, and my thoughts were turned into the channel of their earlier bent. Six years have passed since I resolved on my present undertaking. I can, even now, remember the hour from which I dedicated myself to this great enterprise. I commenced by inuring my body to hardship. I accompanied the whale-fishers on several expeditions to the North Sea. I voluntarily endured cold, famine, thirst, and want of sleep. I often worked harder than the common sailors during the day, and devoted my nights to the study of mathematics, the theory of medicine, and those branches of physical science from which a naval adventurer might derive the greatest practical advantage. 
Twice I actually hired myself as an undermate in a Greenland whaler, and acquitted myself to admiration. I must own I felt a little proud when my captain offered me the second dignity in the vessel, and entreated me to remain with the greatest earnestness. So valuable did he consider my services. And now, my dear Margaret, do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? My life might have been passed in ease and luxury, but I preferred glory to every enticement that wealth placed in my path. Oh, that some encouraging voice would answer in the affirmative! My courage and my resolution is firm, but my hopes fluctuate, and my spirits are often depressed. I am about to proceed on a long and difficult voyage, the emergencies of which will demand all my fortitude. I am required not only to raise the spirits of others, but sometimes to sustain my own when theirs are failing. This is the most favorable period for traveling in Russia. They fly quickly over the snow in their sledges, the motion is pleasant, and in my opinion far more agreeable than that of an English stagecoach. The cold is not excessive, if you are wrapped in furs, a dress which I have already adopted, for there is a great difference between walking the deck and remaining seated motionless for hours, when no exercise prevents the blood from actually freezing in your veins. I have no ambition to lose my life on the post-road between St. Petersburg and Archangel. I shall depart for the latter town in a fortnight or three weeks, and my intention is to hire a ship there, which can easily be done by paying the insurance for the owner, and to engage as many sailors as I think necessary among those who are accustomed to the whale-fishing. I do not intend to sail until the month of June, and when shall I return? Ah, dear sister, how can I answer this question? If I succeed, many, many months, perhaps years, will pass before you and I may meet. If I fail, you will see me again soon, or never. Farewell, my dear, excellent Margaret. Heaven shower down blessings on you, and save me, that I may again and again testify my gratitude for all your love and kindness. Your affectionate brother, R. Walton. Letter 2. Archangel. 28th. March, at an undisclosed time in the 1700s. To Mrs. Seville, England. How slowly the time passes here, encompassed as I am by frost and snow, yet a second step is taken towards my enterprise. I have hired a vessel and am occupied in collecting my sailors. Those whom I have already engaged appear to be men on whom I can depend, and are certainly possessed of dauntless courage. But I have one want which I have never yet been able to satisfy, and the absence of the object of which I now feel as a most severe evil. I have no friend, Margaret. When I am glowing with the enthusiasm of success, there will be none to participate my joy. If I am assailed by disappointment, no one will endeavor to sustain me in dejection. I shall commit my thoughts to paper, it is true, but that is a poor medium for the communication of feeling. I desire the company of a man who could sympathize with me, whose eyes would reply to mine. You may deem me romantic, my dear sister, but I bitterly feel the want of a friend. I have no one near me, gentle yet courageous, possessed of a cultivated as well as of a capacious mind, whose tastes are like my own, to approve or amend my plans. How would such a friend repair the faults of your poor brother? I am too ardent in execution, and too impatient of difficulties. But it is still greater evil to me that I am self-educated. For the first fourteen years of my life I ran wild on a common, and read nothing but our Uncle Thomas' books of voyages. At that age I became acquainted with the celebrated poets of our own country. But it was only when it had ceased to be in my power to derive its most important benefits from such conviction that I perceive the necessity of becoming acquainted with more languages than that of my native country. Now I am twenty-eight, and am in reality more illiterate than many schoolboys of fifteen. It is true that I have thought more, and that my daydreams are more extended and magnificent, but they want, as the painters call it, keeping, and I greatly need a friend who would have sense enough not to despise me as a romantic, and affection enough for me to endeavor to regulate my mind. Well, these are useless complaints. I shall certainly find no friend on the wide ocean, nor even here in Archangel, among merchants and seamen. Yet some feelings, unallied to the dross of human nature, beat even these rugged bosoms. My lieutenant, for instance, is a man of wonderful courage and enterprise, 
he is madly desirous of glory, or rather, to word my phrase more characteristically, of advancement in his profession. He is an Englishman, and in the midst of national and professional prejudices, unsoftened by cultivation, retains some of the noblest endowments of humanity. I first became acquainted with him on board a whale-vessel, finding that he was unemployed in this city. I easily engaged him to assist in my enterprise. The master is a person of excellent disposition, and is remarkable in the ship for his gentleness and the mildness of his discipline. This circumstance, added to his well-known integrity and dauntless courage, made me very desirous to engage him. A youth passed in solitude, my best years spent under your gentle and feminine fosterage, has so refined the groundwork of my character that I cannot overcome an intense distaste to the usual brutality exercised on board ship. I have never believed it to be necessary, and when I heard of a mariner equally noted for his kindliness of heart and the respect and obedience paid to him by his crew, I felt myself peculiarly fortunate in being able to secure his services. I heard of him first in rather a romantic manner, from a lady who owes to him the happiness of her life. This, briefly, is his story. Some years ago he loved a Russian lady of moderate fortune, and having amassed a considerable sum of prize-money, the father of the girl consented to the match. He saw his mistress once before the destined ceremony, but she was bathed in tears, and throwing herself at his feet, entreated him to spare her, confessing at the same time that she loved another, but that he was poor, and that her father would never consent to the union. My generous friend reassured the suppliant, and on being informed of the name of her lover, instantly abandoned his pursuit. He had already bought a farm with his money, on which he had designed to pass the remainder of his life, but he bestowed the whole on his rival, together with the remains of his prize-money to purchase stock, and then himself solicited the young woman's father to consent to her marriage with her lover. But the old man decidedly refused, thinking himself bound in honour to my friend, who, when he found the father inexorable, quitted his country, nor returned until he heard that his former mistress was married according to her inclinations. "'What a noble fellow!' you will exclaim. "'He is so, but then he is wholly uneducated. He is as silent as a Turk, and a kind of ignorant carelessness attends him, which, while it renders his conduct the more astonishing, detracts from the interest and sympathy which otherwise he would command.' Yet do not suppose, because I complain a little, or because I can conceive a consolation for my toils, which I may never know, that I am wavering in my resolutions. Those are fixed as fate, and my voyage is only now delayed until the weather shall permit my embarkation. The winter has been dreadfully severe, but the spring promises well, and it is considered as a remarkably early season, so that perhaps I may sail sooner than I expected. I shall do nothing rashly. You know me sufficiently to confide in my prudence and considerateness whenever the safety of others is committed to my care. I cannot describe to you my sensations on the near prospect of my undertaking. It is impossible to communicate to you a conception of the trembling sensation, half pleasurable and half fearful, with which I am preparing to depart. I am going to unexplored regions, to the land of mist and snow, but I shall kill no albatross, therefore... Do not be alarmed for my safety, or if I should come back to you as worn and woeful as the ancient mariner. You will smile at my illusion, but I will disclose a secret. I have often attributed my attachment to, my passionate enthusiasm for, the dangerous mysteries of ocean to that production of the most imaginative of modern poets. There is something at work in my soul which I do not understand. I am practically industrious, painstaking, a workman to execute with perseverance and labor, but besides this there is a love for the marvellous, a belief in the marvellous, intertwined in all my projects, which hurries me out of the common pathways of men, even to the wild sea and unvisited regions I am about to explore, but to return to dearer considerations. Shall I meet you again, after having traversed immense seas and returned by the most southern cape of Africa or America? I dare not expect such success, yet I cannot bear to look on the reverse of the picture. Continue for the present to write to me, by every opportunity. I may receive your letters on some occasions when I need them most to support my spirits. I love you very tenderly. Remember me with affection, should you never hear from me again. Your affectionate brother, Robert Walton
Letter 3. July 7th, at an undisclosed time in the 1700s. To Mrs. Seville, England. My dear sister, I write a few lines in haste to say that I am safe and well advanced on my voyage. This letter will reach England by a merchantman, now on its homeward voyage from Archangel, more fortunate than I, who may not see my native land perhaps for many years. I am, however, in good spirits. My men are bold and apparently firm of purpose. Nor do the floating sheets of ice that continually pass us, indicating the dangers of the region towards which we are advancing, appear to dismay them. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, and although not so warm as in England, the southern gales, which blow us speedily towards those shores which I so ardently desire to attain, breathe a degree of renovating warmth which I had not expected. No incidents have hitherto befallen us that would make a figure in a letter. One or two stiff gales and the springing of a leak are accidents which experienced navigators scarcely remember to record, and I shall be well content if nothing worse should happen to us during our voyage. Adieu, my dear Margaret. Be assured that for my own sake, as well as yours, I will not rashly encounter danger. I will be cool, persevering, and prudent. But success shall crown my endeavours. Wherefore not? Thus far I have gone, tracing a secure way over the pathless seas, the very stars themselves being witnesses and testimonies of my triumph. Why not still proceed over the untamed yet obedient element? What can stop the determined heart and resolved will of man? My swelling heart involuntarily pours itself out thus, but I must finish. Heaven bless my beloved sister. R. W. Letter 4 August 5th, at an undisclosed time in the 1700s. To Mrs. Seville, England. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it, although it is very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice, which closed in the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving her the sea-room in which she floated. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were compassed round by a very thick fog. We accordingly laid to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. About two o'clock the mist cleared away, and we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention and diverted our solicitude from our own situation. We perceived a low carriage, fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs, pass on towards the north. At the distance of a half-mile, a being which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge and guided the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveller with our telescopes until he was lost among the distant inequalities of the ice. This appearance excited our unqualified wonder. We were, as we believed, many hundred miles from any land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not, in reality, so distant as we had supposed. Shut in, however, by the ice, it was impossible to follow his track, which we had observed with the greatest attention. About two hours after this occurrence we heard the ground sea, and before night the ice broke and freed our ship. We, however, lay to until the morning fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. I profited of this time to rest for a few hours. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge, like that we had seen before, which had drifted towards us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, but there was a human being within it, whom the sailors were persuading to enter the vessel. He was not, as the other travellers seemed to be, a savage inhabited of some undiscovered island, but a European. When I appeared on deck, the master said, "'Here is our captain, and he will not allow you to perish on the open sea.' On perceiving me, the stranger addressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. "'Before I come aboard your vessel,' said he, "'Will you have the kindness to inform me whether you are bound?' 
You may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction, and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he would not have exchanged for the most precious wealth the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery towards the northern pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. Good God, Margaret, if you had seen the man who thus capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen, and his body dreadfully emaciated by fatigue and suffering. I never saw a man in so wretched a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. As soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees he recovered and ate a little soup, which restored him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and I often feared that his suffering had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him from my own cabin and attended him as much as my duty would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness, and even madness, but there are moments when, if any one performs an act of kindness towards him, or does him any the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were, with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equalled. But he is generally melancholy and despairing, and sometimes he gnashes his teeth, as if impatient of the weight of woes that oppresses him. When my guest was a little recovered, I had great trouble to keep off the men, who wished to ask him a thousand questions, but I would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity, in a state of body and mind whose restoration evidently depended upon entire repose. Once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom, and he replied, To seek the one who fled from me. And did the man whom you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him, for the day before we picked you up we saw some dogs drawing a sledge with a man in it, across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the demon, as he called him, had pursued. Soon after, when he was alone with me, he said, I have doubtless excited your curiosity, as well as that of these good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly, it would indeed be very impertinent and inhuman in me to trouble you with any inquisitiveness of mine. And yet you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently restored me to life. Soon after this he inquired if I thought that the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge. I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty for the ice had not broken until near midnight, and the traveller might have arrived at a place of safety before that time. But of this I could not judge. From this time a new spirit of life animated the decaying frame of the stranger. He manifested the greatest eagerness to be upon deck to watch for the sledge which had before appeared. But I have persuaded him to remain in the cabin, for he is far too weak to sustain the rawness of the atmosphere. I have promised that someone should watch for him, and give him instant notice if any new object should appear in sight. Such is my journal of what relates to this strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but is very silent and appears uneasy when anyone except myself enters his cabin. Yet his manners are so conciliating and gentle that the sailors are all interested in him, although they have had very little communication with him. For my own part I began to love him as a brother and his constant and deep grief fills me with sympathy and compassion. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, being even now in wreck so attractive and amiable. I said in one of my letters, my dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide ocean. Yet I have found a man who, before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as the brother of my heart. I shall continue my journal concerning the stranger at intervals, should I have any fresh incidents to record. August 13th, at an undisclosed time in the 1700s. My affection for my guest increases every day. He excites at once my admiration and my pity to an astonishing degree. 
How can I see so noble a creature destroyed by misery without feeling the most poignant grief? He is so gentle, yet so wise. His mind is so cultivated, and when he speaks, although his words are cold with the choicest art, yet they flow with rapidity and unparalleled eloquence. He is now much recovered from his illness, and is continually on the deck, apparently watching for the sledge that preceded his own. Yet although unhappy, he is not so utterly occupied by his own misery, but that he interests himself deeply in the projects of others. He has frequently conversed with me on mine, which I have communicated to him without disguise. He entered attentively into all my arguments in favour of my eventual success, and into every minute detail of the measures I had taken to secure it. I was easily led by the sympathy which he evinced to use the language of my heart, to give utterance to the burning ardour of my soul, and to say, with all the fervour that warmed me, how gladly I would sacrifice my fortune, my existence, my every hope, to furtherance of my enterprise. One man's life or death were but a small price to pay for the acquirement of the knowledge which I sought, for the dominion I should acquire and transmit over the elemental foes of our race. As I spoke, a dark gloom spread over my listener's countenance. At first I perceived that he tried to suppress his emotion. He placed his hands before his eyes, and my voice quivered and failed me, as I beheld tears trickle fast from between his fingers. A groan burst from his heaving breast. I paused. At length he spoke in broken accents. "'Unhappy man! Do you share my madness? Have you drunk also of the intoxicating draught? Hear me. Let me reveal my tale, and you will dash the cup from your lips.' Such words, you may imagine, strongly excited my curiosity, but the paroxysm of grief that had seized the stranger overcame his weakened powers, and many hours of repose and tranquil conversation were necessary to restore his composure. Having conquered the violence of his feelings, he appeared to despise himself for being the slave of passion and quelling the dark tyranny of despair. He led me again to converse concerning myself personally. He asked me the history of my earlier years. The tale was quickly told, but it awakened various trains of reflection. I spoke of my desire of finding a friend, of my thirst for a more intimate sympathy with a fellow-mind than had ever fallen to my lot, and expressed my conviction that a man could boast of little happiness who did not enjoy this blessing. "'I agree with you,' replied the stranger. "'We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. If one wiser, better, dearer than ourselves, such a friend ought to be, do not lend his aid to perfectionate our weak and faulty natures. I once had a friend, the most noble of human creatures, and I am entitled, therefore, to judge respecting friendship. You have hope and the world before you, and have no cause for despair, but I, I have lost everything and cannot begin life anew. As he said this, his countenance became expressive of a calm, settled grief that touched me to the heart but he was silent and presently retired to his cabin. Even broken in spirit as he is, no one can feel more deeply than he does the beauties of nature. The starry sky, the sea, and every sight afforded by these wonderful regions seem still to have the power of elevating his soul from earth. Such a man has double existence. He may suffer misery and be overwhelmed by disappointments, yet when he is retired into himself, he will be like a celestial spirit that has a halo around him, within whose circle no grief or folly ventures. Will you smile at the enthusiasm I express concerning this divine wanderer? You would not if you saw him. You have been tutored and refined by books and retirement from the world, and you are therefore somewhat fastidious, but this only renders you the more fit to appreciate the extraordinary merits of this wonderful man. Sometimes I have endeavoured to discover what quality it is that he possesses that elevates him so immeasurably above any other person I ever knew. I believe it to be an intuitive discernment, a quick but never-failing power of judgment, a penetration into the causes of things, unequalled for clearness and precision. Add to this a facility of expression and a voice whose varied intonations are soul-subduing music. August 19th at an undisclosed time in the seventeen hundreds. Yesterday the stranger said to me, You may easily perceive, Captain Walton, that I have suffered great and unparalleled misfortunes. I had determined at one time that the memory of these evils should die with me, 
But you have won me to alter my determination. You seek for knowledge and wisdom as I once did, and I ardently hope that the gratification of your wishes may not be a serpent to sting you, as mine has been. I do not know that the relation of my disasters will be useful to you, yet when I reflect that you are pursuing the same course, exposing yourself to the same dangers which have rendered me what I am, I imagine that you may deduce an apt moral from my tale, one that may direct you if you succeed in your undertaking and console you in case of failure. Prepare to hear of occurrences which are usually deemed marvellous. Were we among the tamer scenes of nature, I might fear to encounter your unbelief, perhaps your ridicule, but many things will appear possible in these wild and mysterious regions which would provoke the laughter of those unacquainted with the ever-varied powers of nature. Nor can I doubt but that my tale conveys in its series internal evidence of the truth of the events of which it is composed. You may easily imagine that I was much gratified by the offered communication, yet I could not endure that he should renew his grief by a recital of his misfortunes. I felt the greatest eagerness to hear the promised narrative, partly from curiosity and partly from a strong desire to ameliorate his fate if it were in my power. I expressed these feelings in my answer. I thank you, he replied, for your sympathy, but it is useless. My fate is nearly fulfilled. I wait but for one event, and then I shall repose in peace. I understand your feeling, continued he, perceiving that I wished to interrupt him, but you are mistaken, my friend, if thus you will allow me to name you. Nothing can alter my destiny. Listen to my history, and you will perceive how irrevocably it is determined. He then told me that he would commence his narrative the next day when I should be at leisure. This promise drew from me the warmest thanks. I have resolved every night, when I am not imperatively occupied by my duties, to record, as nearly as possible in his own words, what he has related during the day. If I should be engaged, I will at least make notes. This manuscript will doubtless afford you the greatest pleasure, but to me, who know him, and who hear it from his own lips, with what interest and sympathy shall I read it in some future day? Even now, as I commence my task, his full-toned voice swells in my ears, his lustrous eyes dwell on me with all their melancholy sweetness. I see his thin hand raised in animation, while the lineaments of his face are irradiated by the soul within. Strange and harrowing must be his story, frightful the storm which embraced the gallant vessel on its course and wrecked it thus. End of Letters Chapter One of Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors had been for many years councillors and syndics, and my father had filled several public situations with honour and reputation. He was respected by all who knew him for his integrity and indefatigable attention to public business. He passed his younger days perpetually occupied by the affairs of his country. A variety of circumstances had prevented his marrying early, nor was it until the decline of life that he became a husband and the father of a family. As the circumstances of his marriage illustrate his character, I cannot refrain from relating them. One of his most intimate friends was a merchant who, from a flourishing state, fell through numerous mischances into poverty. This man, whose name was Buford, was a proud and unbending disposition, and could not bear to live in poverty and oblivion in the same country where he had formerly been distinguished for his rank and magnificence. Having paid his debts, therefore, in the most honourable manner, he retreated with his daughter to the town of Lucerne, where he lived unknown and in wretchedness. My father loved Buford with the truest friendship, and was deeply grieved by his retreat in these unfortunate circumstances. He bitterly deplored the false pride which led his friend to a conduct so little worthy of the affection that united them. He lost no time in endeavouring to seek him out, with the hope of persuading him to begin the world again through his credit and assistance. Buford had taken effectual measures to conceal himself, and it was ten months before my father discovered his abode. Overjoyed at this discovery, he hastened to the house, which was situated in a mean street near the roofs. But when he entered, misery and despair alone welcomed him. Buford had saved but a very small sum of money from the wreck of his fortunes. 
but it was sufficient to provide him with sustenance for some months, and in the meantime he hoped to procure some respectable employment in a merchant's house. The interval was, consequently, spent in inaction. His grief only became more deep and rankling when he had leisure for reflection, and at length it took so fast hold of his mind that at the end of three months he lay on a bed of sickness incapable of any exertion. His daughter attended him with the greatest tenderness, but she saw with despair that their little fund was rapidly decreasing, and that there was no other prospect of support. But Caroline Beaufort possessed a mind of an uncommon mould, and her courage rose to support her in her adversity. She procured plain work, she plaited straw, and by various means contrived to earn a pittance scarcely sufficient to support life. Several months passed in this manner. Her father grew worse. Her time was more entirely occupied in attending him. Her means of subsistence decreased, and in the tenth month her father died in her arms, leaving her an orphan and a beggar. This last blow overcame her, and she knelt by Beaufort's coffin, weeping bitterly. When my father entered the chamber, he came like a protecting spirit to the poor girl, who committed herself to his care, and after the interment of his friend, he conducted her to Geneva and placed her under the protection of a relation. Two years after this event, Caroline became his wife. There was a considerable difference between the ages of my parents, but this circumstance seemed to unite them only closer in bonds of devoted affection. There was a sense of justice in my father's upright mind which rendered it necessary that he should approve highly to love strongly. Perhaps during former years he had suffered from the late discovered unworthiness of one beloved, and so was disposed to set a greater value on tried worth. There was a show of gratitude and worship in his attachment to my mother, differing wholly from the doting fondness of age for it was inspired by reverence for her virtues, and a desire to be the means of, in some degree, recompensing her for the sorrows she had endured, but which gave inexpressible grace to his behavior to her. Everything was made to yield to her wishes and her convenience. He strove to shelter her, as a fair exotic is sheltered by the gardener, from every rougher wind, and to surround her with all that could tend to excite pleasurable emotion in her soft and benevolent mind. Her health, and even the tranquillity of her hitherto constant spirit had been shaken by what she had gone through. During the two years that had elapsed previous to their marriage, my father had gradually relinquished all his public functions, and immediately after their union they sought the pleasant climate of Italy, and the change of scene and interest attendant on a tour through that land of wonders as a restorative for her weakened frame. From Italy they visited Germany and France. I, their eldest child, was born in Naples, and as an infant accompanied them in their rambles. I remained for several years their only child. Much as they were attached to each other, they seemed to draw inexhaustible stores of affection from a very mine of love to bestow them upon me. My mother's tender caresses and my father's smile of benevolent pleasure while regarding me are my first recollections. I was their plaything and their idol, and something better, their child the innocent and helpless creature bestowed on them by heaven, whom to bring up to good and whose future lot it was in their hands to direct to happiness or misery, according as they fulfilled their duties towards me. With this deep consciousness of what they owed towards the being to which they had given life, added to the active spirit of tenderness that animated both, it may be imagined that while during every hour of my infant life I received a lesson of patience, of charity, and of self-control, I was so guided by a silken cord that all seemed but one train of enjoyment to me. For a long time I was their only care. My mother had much desired to have a daughter, but I continued their single offspring. When I was about five years old, while making an excursion beyond the frontiers of Italy, they passed a week on the shores of the lake of Como. Their benevolent disposition often made them enter the cottages of the poor. This, to my mother, was more than a duty. It was a necessity, a passion, remembering what she had suffered and how she had been relieved, for her to act in turn, the guardian angel to the afflicted. During one of their walks, a poor cot in the foldings of a veil attracted their notice as being singularly disconsolate, while the number of half-clothed children gathered about it spoke of penury in its worst shape. One day, when my father had gone by himself to Milan, my mother, accompanied by me, visited this abode. 
She found a peasant and his wife, hard-working, bent down by care and labor, distributing a scanty meal to five hungry babes. Among these there was one which attracted my mother far above all the rest. She appeared of a different stock. The four others were dark-eyed, hardy little vagrants. This child was thin and very fair. Her hair was the brightest living gold, and despite the poverty of her clothing, seemed to set a crown of distinction on her head. Her brow was clear and ample, her blue eyes cloudless, and her lips and the moulding of her face so expressive of sensibility and sweetness that none could behold her without looking on her as of a distinct species, a being heaven-sent and bearing a celestial stamp in all her features. The peasant woman, perceiving that my mother fixed eyes of wonder and admiration on this lovely girl, eagerly communicated her history. She was not her child, but the daughter of a Milanese nobleman. Her mother was a German and had died on giving birth. The infant had been placed with these good people to nurse. They were better off then. They had not been long married, and their eldest child was but just born. The father of their charge was one of those Italians nursed in the memory of the antique glory of Italy, one among the Schiavi Agnor Frumenti, who exerted himself to obtain the liberty of his country. He became the victim of its weakness. Whether he had died or still lingered in the dungeons of Austria was not known. His property was confiscated. His child became an orphan and a beggar. She continued with her foster parents and bloomed in their rude abode, fairer than a garden rose among dark-leaved brambles. When my father returned from Milan, he found playing with me in the hall of our villa a child fairer than pictured cherub, a creature who seemed to shed radiance from her looks and whose form and motions were lighter than the chamois of the hills. The apparition was soon explained. With his permission, my mother prevailed on her rustic guardians to yield their charge to her. They were fond of the sweet orphan. Her presence had seemed a blessing to them, but it would be unfair to her to keep her in poverty and want when Providence afforded her such powerful protection. They consulted their village priest, and the result was that Elizabeth Lavenza became the inmate of my parents' house, my more than sister, the beautiful and adored companion of all my occupations and my pleasures. Everyone loved Elizabeth. The passionate and almost reverential attachment with which all regarded her became, while I shared it, my pride and my delight. On the evening previous to her being brought to my home, my mother had said playfully, I have a pretty present for my victor. Tomorrow he shall have it. And when on the morrow she presented Elizabeth to me as her promised gift, I, with childish seriousness, interpreted her words literally, and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love, and cherish. All praises bestowed on her I received as made to a possession of my own. We called each other familiarly by the name of cousin. No word, no expression could body forth the kind of relation in which she stood to me, my more than sister, since till death she was to be mine only. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus We were brought up together. There was not quite a year difference in our ages. I need not say that we were strangers to any species of disunion or dispute. Harmony was the soul of our companionship, and the diversity and contrast that subsisted in our characters drew us nearer together. Elizabeth was of a calmer and more concentrated disposition, but with all my ardor I was capable of more intense application and was more deeply smitten with the thirst for knowledge. She busied herself with following the aerial creations of the poets, and in the majestic and wondrous scenes which surrounded our Swiss home, the sublime shapes of the mountains, the changes of the seasons, tempest and calm, the silence of winter, and the life and turbulence of our alpine summers, she found ample scope for admiration and delight, while my companion contemplated with a serious and satisfied spirit the magnificent appearances of things, I delighted in investigating their causes. The world was to me a secret which I desired to divine. Curiosity, earnest research to learn the hidden laws of nature, gladness akin to rapture as they were unfolded to me, are among the earliest sensations I can remember. On the birth of a second son, my junior, by seven years, my parents gave up entirely their wandering life, and fixed themselves in their native country. We possessed a house in Geneva, 
and a campagna on bell reef the eastern shore of the lake at the distance of rather more than a league from the city we resided principally in the latter and the lives of my parents were passed in considerable seclusion it was my temper to avoid a crowd and to attach myself fervently to a few I was indifferent, therefore, to my schoolfellows in general, but I united myself in the bonds of the closest friendship to one among them. Henry Clerval was the son of a merchant of Geneva. He was a boy of singular talent and fancy. He loved enterprise, hardship, and even danger for its own sake. He was deeply read in books of chivalry and romance. He composed heroic songs and began to write many a tale of enchantment and knightly adventure. He tried to make us act plays and to enter into masquerades in which the characters were drawn from the heroes of roncesvalles of the round table of king arthur and the chivalrous train who shed their blood to redeem the holy sepulchre from the hands of the infidels no human being could have passed a happier childhood than myself my parents were possessed by the very spirit of kindness and indulgence we felt that they were not the tyrants to rule our lot according to their caprice but the agents and creators of all the many delights which we enjoyed. When I mingled with other families, I distinctly discerned how peculiarly fortunate my lot was, and gratitude assisted the development of filial love. My temper was sometimes violent, and my passions vehement, but by some law in my temperature they were turned not towards childish pursuits, but to an eager desire to learn, and not to learn all things indiscriminately. I confess that neither the structure of languages, nor the code of governments, nor the politics of various states possessed attractions for me. It was the secrets of heaven and earth that I desired to learn. And whether it was the outward substance of things, or the inner spirit of nature, and the mysterious soul of man that occupied me, still my inquiries were directed to the metaphysical, or in its highest sense, the physical secrets of the world. Meanwhile, Clerval occupied himself, so to speak, with the moral relations of things. The busy stage of life, the virtues of heroes, and the actions of men were his theme, and his hope and his dream was to become one among those whose names are recorded in story as the gallant and adventurous benefactors of our species. The saintly soul of Elizabeth shone like a shrine dedicated lamp in our peaceful home. Her sympathy was ours, her smile, her soft voice, the sweet glance of her celestial eyes, were ever there to bless and animate us. She was the living spirit of love to soften and attract. I might have become sullen in my study, wrought through the ardour of my nature, but that she was there to subdue me to a semblance of her own gentleness. And Clerval, could aught ill entrench on the noble spirit of Clerval? Yet he might not have been so perfectly humane, so thoughtful in his generosity so full of kindness and tenderness amidst his passion for adventurous exploit, had she not unfolded to him the real loveliness of beneficence, and made the doing good the end and aim of his soaring ambition. I feel exquisite pleasure on dwelling on the recollections of childhood. Before misfortune had tainted my mind and changed its bright visions of extensive usefulness into gloomy and narrow reflections upon self, Besides, in drawing the picture of my early days, I also record those events which led by insensible steps to my after-tale of misery, for when I would account to myself for the birth of that passion which afterwards ruled my destiny, I find it arise, like a mountain river, from ignoble and almost forgotten sources, but swelling as it proceeded, it became the torrent which, in its course, has swept away all my hopes and joys. Natural philosophy is the genius that has regulated my fate. I desire, therefore, in this narration, to state those facts which led to my predilection for that science. When I was thirteen years of age, we all went on a party of pleasure to the baths near Thonon. The inclemency of the weather obliged us to remain a day confined to the inn. In this house I chanced to find a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa. I opened it with apathy. The theory with which he attempts to demonstrate, and the wonderful facts which he relates, soon changed this feeling into enthusiasm. A new light seemed to dawn upon my mind, and bounding with joy I communicated my discovery to my father. My father looked carelessly at the title-page of my book, and said, Ah! Cornelius Agrippa! My dear Victor, do not waste your time upon this. It is sad trash. 
If instead of this remark my father had taken the pains to explain to me that the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded, and that a modern system of science had been introduced which possessed much greater powers than the ancient, because the powers of the latter were chimerical, while those of the former were real and practical, under such circumstances I should certainly have thrown Agrippa aside and have contented my imagination, warmed as it was, by returning with greater ardour to my former studies. It is even possible that the train of my ideas would never have received the fatal impulse that led to my ruin, but the cursory glance my father had taken of my volume by no means assured me that he was acquainted with its contents, and I continued to read with the greatest avidity. When I returned home, my first care was to procure the whole works of this author, and afterwards of Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. I read and studied the wild fancies of these writers with delight. They appeared to me treasures known to few besides myself. I have described myself as always having been imbued with a fervent longing to penetrate the secrets of nature. In spite of the intense labor and wonderful discoveries of modern philosophers, I always come from my studies discontented and unsatisfied. Sir Isaac Newton is said to have avowed that he felt like a child picking up shells beside the great and unexplored ocean of truth. Those of his successors in each branch of natural philosophy with whom I was acquainted appeared even to my boy's apprehensions as Tyros engaged in the same pursuit. The untaught peasant beheld the elements around him and was acquainted with their practical uses. The most learned philosopher knew little more. He had partially unveiled the face of nature, but her immortal lineaments were still a wonder and a mystery. He might dissect, anatomize, and give names but not to speak of a final cause. Causes in their secondary and tertiary grades were utterly unknown to him. I had gazed upon the fortifications and impediments that seemed to keep human beings from entering the citadel of nature, and rashly and ignorantly I had repined. But here were books, and here were men who had penetrated deeper and knew more. I took their word for all that they averred, and I became their disciple. It may appear strange that such should arise in the eighteenth century, but while I followed the routine of education in the schools of Geneva, I was to a great degree self-taught with regard to my favorite studies. My father was not scientific, and I was left to struggle with a child's blindness, added to a student's thirst for knowledge. Under the guidance of my new preceptors, I entered with the greatest diligence into the search of the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life but the latter soon obtained my undivided attention. Wealth was an inferior object, but what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death? Nor were these my only visions. The raising of ghosts or devils was a promise liberally accorded by my favorite authors, the fulfillment of which I most eagerly sought and if my incantations were always unsuccessful, I attributed the failure rather to my own inexperience and mistake than to a want of skill or fidelity in my instructors. And thus for a time I was occupied by exploded systems, mingling, like an unadept, a thousand contradictory theories and floundering desperately in a very slew of multifarious knowledge, guided by an ardent imagination and childish reasoning till an accident again changed the current of my ideas. When I was about fifteen years old, we had retired to our house near Belrive, when we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. It advanced from behind the mountains of Jura, and the thunder burst at once with frightful loudness from various quarters of the heavens. I remained, while the storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity and delight. As I stood at the door, on a sudden I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak, which stood about twenty yards from our house, and so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When we visited it the next morning, we found the tree shattered in a singular manner. It was not splintered by the shock, but entirely reduced to thin ribbons of wood. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. Before this I was not acquainted with the more obvious laws of electricity, 
on this occasion a man of great research in natural philosophy was with us and excited by this catastrophe he entered on the explanation of a theory which he had formed on the subject of electricity and galvanism which was at once new and astonishing to me all that he said threw greatly into the shade cornelius agrippa albertus magnus and paracelsus the lords of my imagination but by some fatality the overthrow of these men disinclined me to pursue my accustomed studies it seemed to me as if nothing would or could ever be known all that had so long engaged my attention suddenly grew despicable by one of those caprices of the mind which we are perhaps most subject to in early youth i at once gave up my former occupations set down natural history and all its progeny as a deformed and abortive creation and entertained the greatest disdain for would-be science which could never even stop within the threshold of real knowledge in this mood of mind i betook myself to the mathematics and the branches of study appertaining to that science as being built upon secure foundations and so worthy of my consideration thus strangely are our souls constructed and by such slight ligaments are we bound to prosperity or ruin when i look back it seems to me as if this almost miraculous change of inclination and will was the immediate suggestion of the guardian angel of my life the last effort made by the spirit of preservation to avert the storm that was even then hanging in the stars and ready to envelop me her victory was announced by an unusual tranquillity and gladness of soul which followed the relinquishing of my ancient and latterly tormenting studies it was thus that i was to be taught to associate evil with their prosecution happiness with their disregard it was a strong effort of the spirit of good but it was ineffectual destiny was too potent and her immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction End of chapter two chapter three of frankenstein or the modern prometheus when i had attained the age of seventeen my parents resolved that i should become a student at the university of ingolstadt i had hitherto attended the schools of geneva but my father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that i should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country my departure was therefore fixed at an early date but before the day resolved upon could arrive the first misfortune of my life occurred an omen as it were of my future misery elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever her illness was severe and she was in the greatest danger during her illness many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her she had at first yielded to our entreaties but when she heard that the life of her favorite was menaced she could no longer control her anxiety she attended her sickbed her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignity of the distemper elizabeth was saved but the consequences of this imprudence were fatal to her preserver on the third day my mother sickened her fever was accompanied by the most alarming symptoms and the looks of her medical attendants prognosticated the worst event on her deathbed the fortitude and benignity of this best of women did not desert her she joined the hands of elizabeth and myself my children she said my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place to my younger children. Alas! I regret that I am taken from you. And, happy and beloved as I have been, is it not hard to quit you all? But these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavour to resign myself cheerfully to death and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world she died calmly and her countenance expressed affection even in death i need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil the void that presents itself to the soul and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance it is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she whom we saw every day and whose very existence appeared a part of our own can have departed for ever that the brightness of a beloved eye can have been extinguished and the sound of a voice so familiar and dear to the ear can be hushed never more to be heard these are the reflections of the first days but when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil then the actual bitterness of grief commences yet from whom has not that rude hand rent away some dear connection 
and why should I describe a sorrow which all have felt and must feel? The time at length arrives when grief is rather an indulgence than a necessity, and the smile that plays upon the lips, although it may be deemed a sacrilege, is not banished. My mother was dead, but we had still duties which we ought to perform. We must continue our course with the rest, and learn to think ourselves fortunate whilst one remains whom the spoiler has not seized. My departure for Ingolstadt, which had been deferred by these events, was now again determined upon. I obtained from my father a respite of some weeks. It appeared to me sacrilege so soon to leave the repose akin to death of the house of mourning and to rush into the thick of life. I was new to sorrow, but it did not the less alarm me. I was unwilling to quit the sight of those that remained to me, and, above all, I desired to see my sweet Elizabeth in some degree consoled. She indeed veiled her grief, and strove to act the comforter to us all. She looked steadily on life, and assumed its duties with courage and zeal. She devoted herself to those whom she had been taught to call her uncle and cousins. Never was she so enchanting as at this time, when she recalled the sunshine of her smiles, and spent them upon us. She forgot her own regret in her endeavours to make us forget. The day of my departure at length arrived. Clerval spent the last evening with us. He had endeavoured to persuade his father to permit him to accompany me and to become my fellow-student, but in vain. His father was a narrow-minded traitor, and saw idleness and ruin in the aspirations and ambition of his son. Henry deeply felt the misfortune of being debarred from a liberal education. He said little, but when he spoke, I read in his kindling eye and in his animated glance a restrained but firm resolve not to be chained by the miserable details of commerce. We sat late. We could not tear ourselves away from each other, nor persuade ourselves to say the word farewell. It was said, and we retired under the pretense of seeking repose, each fancying that the other was deceived. But when at morning's dawn I descended to the carriage which was to convey me away, they were all there, my father again to bless me, Clerval to press my hand once more, my Elizabeth to renew her entreaties that I would write often, and to bestow the last feminine attentions on her playmate and friend. I threw myself into the chaise that was to convey me away, and indulged in the most melancholy reflections. I, who had ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in endeavouring to bestow mutual pleasure, I was now alone. In the university, whither I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. My life had hitherto been remarkably secluded and domestic, and this had given me invincible repugnance to new countenances. I loved my brothers, Elizabeth and Clerval. These were old familiar faces, but I believed myself totally unfitted for the company of strangers. Such were my reflections as I commenced my journey. But as I proceeded, my spirits and hopes rose. I ardently desired the acquisition of knowledge. I had often, when at home, thought it hard to remain during my youth cooped up in one place, and had longed to enter the world and take my station among other human beings. Now my desires were complied with, and it would, indeed, have been folly to repent. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingolstadt, which was long and fatiguing. At length the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment to spend the evening as I pleased. The next morning I delivered my letters of introduction and paid a visit to some of the principal professors. Chance, or rather the evil influence, the angel of destruction, which asserted omnipotent sway over me from the moment I turned my reluctant steps from my father's door, led me first to Monsieur Kremp, professor of natural philosophy. He was an uncouth man but deeply imbued in the secrets of his science. He asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I replied carelessly and partly in contempt, mentioned the names of the alchemists as the principal authors I had studied. The professor stared. "'Have you,' he said, "'really spent your time in studying such nonsense?' I replied in the affirmative. "'Every minute,' continued Monsieur Kremp with warmth. Every instant that you have wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You have burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names. Good God! In what desert land have you lived, where no one was kind enough to inform you that these fancies which you have so greedily imbibed 
are a thousand years old and as musty as they are ancient. I little expected in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Paracelsus. My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely anew. So saying, he stepped aside and wrote down a list of several books treating of natural philosophy, which he desired me to procure, and dismissed me after mentioning that in the beginning of the following week he intended to commence a course of lectures upon natural philosophy in its general relations, and that Monsieur Waldman, a fellow professor, would lecture upon chemistry the alternate days that he omitted. I returned home not disappointed, for I have said that I had long considered those authors useless whom the professor reprobated, but I returned not at all the more inclined to recur to those studies in any shape. Monsieur Kremp was a little squat man with a gruff voice and a repulsive countenance. The teacher, therefore, did not prepossess me in favour of his pursuits. In rather a too philosophical and connected a strain, perhaps, I have given an account of the conclusions I had come to concerning them in my early years. As a child I had not been content with the results promised by the modern professors of natural science, with a confusion of ideas only to be accounted for by my extreme youth and my want of a guide on such matters, I had retrod the steps of knowledge along the paths of time, and exchanged the discoveries of recent inquirers for the dreams of forgotten alchemists. Besides, I had a contempt for the uses of modern natural philosophy. It was very different when the masters of science sought immortality and power. Such views, although futile, were grand. But now the scene was changed. The ambition of the inquirer seemed to limit itself to the annihilation of those visions on which my interest in science was chiefly founded. I was required to exchange chimeras of boundless grandeur for realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during the first two or three days of my residence at Ingolstadt, which were chiefly spent in becoming acquainted with the localities and the principal residents in my new abode. But as the ensuing week commenced, I thought of the information which Monsieur Kremp had given me concerning the lectures, and although I could not consent to go and hear that little conceited fellow deliver sentences out of a pulpit, I recollected what he said of Monsieur Waldman, whom I had never seen, as he had hitherto been out of town. Partly from curiosity, and partly from idleness, I went into the lecturing room which Monsieur Waldman entered shortly after. The professor was very unlike his colleague. He appeared about fifty years of age, but with an aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few grey hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. His person was short, but remarkably erect, and his voice the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a recapitulation of the history of chemistry, and the various improvements made by different men of learning pronouncing with fervour the names of the most distinguished discoverers. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science and explained many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little, they know that metals cannot be transmuted, and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers, whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt, and their eyes to pore over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascend into the heavens, they have discovered how the blood circulates, and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquakes, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. Such were the professor's words. Rather let me say such the words of the fate, announced to destroy me. As he went on I felt as if my soul were grappling with a palpable enemy, one by one the various keys were touched which formed the mechanism of my being. Chord after chord was sounded, and soon my mind was filled with one thought, one conception, one purpose. So much has been done, exclaimed the soul of Frankenstein. More, far more, will I achieve. 
Treading in the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation. I closed my eyes that night. My internal being was in a state of insurrection and turmoil. I felt that order would thence arise, but I had no power to produce it. By degrees, after the morning's dawn, sleep came. I awoke, and my yesternight's thoughts were as a dream. There only remained a resolution to return to my ancient studies, and to devote myself to a science for which I believed myself to possess a natural talent. On the same day I paid Monsieur Waldman a visit. His manners in private were even more mild and attractive than in public, for there was a certain dignity in his mien during his lecture, which in his own house was replaced by the greatest affability and kindness. I gave him pretty nearly the same account of my former pursuits as I had given to his fellow professor. He heard with attention the little narration concerning my studies, and smiled at the names of Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus, but without the contempt that Monsieur Kremp had exhibited. He said that, these were men to whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers were indebted for most of the foundations of their knowledge. They had left to us, as an easier task, to give new names and arrange in connected classifications the facts which they in a great degree had been the instruments of bringing to light. The labours of men of genius, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the solid advantage of mankind. I listened to his statement, which was delivered without any presumption or affectation, and then added that his lecture had removed my prejudices against modern chemists. I expressed myself in measured terms with the modesty and deference due from a youth to his instructor, without letting escape inexperience in life would have made me ashamed, any of the enthusiasm which stimulated my intended labours. I requested his advice concerning the books I ought to procure. I am happy said Monsieur Waldman, to have gained a disciple, and if your application equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success. Chemistry is that branch of natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been and may be made. It is on that account that I have made it my peculiar study, but at the same time I have not neglected the other branches of science. A man would make but a very sorry chemist if he attended to that department of human knowledge alone. If your wish is to become really a man of science and not merely a petty experimentalist, I should advise you to apply to every branch of natural philosophy, including mathematics. He then took me into his laboratory and explained to me the uses of his various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure and promising me the use of his own when I should have advanced far enough in the science not to derange their mechanism. He also gave me the list of books which I had requested, and I took my leave. Thus ended a day memorable to me. It decided my future destiny. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Caden Clegg, the Lunar Island. Blogspot. Com. From this day, natural philosophy, and particularly chemistry in the most comprehensive sense of the term, became nearly my sole occupation. I read with ardor those works so full of genius and discrimination which modern inquirers have written on these subjects. I attended the lectures and cultivated the acquaintances of the men of science of the university and I found even in Monsieur Kremp a great deal of sound sense and real information, combined, it is true, with a repulsive physiognomy and manners, but not on that account the less valuable. In Monsieur Waldman I found a true friend. His gentleness was never tinged by dogmatism, and his instructions were given with an air of frankness and good nature that banished every idea of pedantry. In a thousand ways he smoothed for me the path of knowledge, and made the most abstruse inquiries clear and facile to my apprehension. My application was at first fluctuating and uncertain. It gained strength as I proceeded, and soon became so ardent and eager that the stars often disappeared in the light of morning whilst I was yet engaged in my laboratory. As I applied so closely, it may be easily conceived that my progress was rapid. 
My ardor was indeed the astonishment of the students, and my proficiency that of the masters. Professor Kremp often asked me, with a sly smile, how Cornelius Agrippa went on, whilst Monsieur Waldman expressed the most heartfelt exultation in my progress. Two years passed in this manner, during which I paid no visit to Geneva, but was engaged heart and soul in the pursuit of some discoveries which I hoped to make. None but those who have experienced them can conceive of the enticements of science. In other studies you go as far as others have gone before you, and there is nothing more to know. But in a scientific pursuit there is continual food for discovery and wonder. A mind of moderate capacity which closely pursues one study must infallibly arrive at great proficiency in that study. And I, who continually sought the attainment of one object of pursuit, and was solely wrapped up in this, improved so rapidly that at the end of two years I made some discoveries in the improvement of some chemical instruments which procured me great esteem and admiration at the university. When I had arrived at this point, and had become as well acquainted with theory and practice of natural philosophy as depended on the lessons of any of the professors at Ingolstadt, my residence there no longer being conducive to my improvements, I thought of returning to my friends and my native town, when an incident happened that protracted my stay. One of the phenomena which had peculiarly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and, indeed, any animal endued with life. Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one which has ever been considered as a mystery. Yet with how many things are we upon the brink of becoming acquainted, if cowardice or carelessness did not restrain our inquiries? I revolved these circumstances in my mind, and determined thenceforth to apply myself more particularly to those branches of natural philosophy which relate to physiology. Unless I had been animated by an almost supernatural enthusiasm, my application to this study would have been irksome and almost intolerable. To examine the causes of life we must first have recourse to death. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. In my education my father had taken the greatest precautions that my mind should be impressed with no supernatural horrors. I do not ever remember to have troubled at a tale of superstition, or to have feared the apparition of a spirit. Darkness had no effect on my fancy, and a churchyard was to me merely the receptacle of bodies deprived of life, which, from being the seat of beauty and strength, had become food for the worm. Now I was led to examine the cause and progress of this decay, and forced to spend days and nights in vaults and charnel-houses. My attention was fixed upon every object the most insupportable to the delicacy of the human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. I paused, examining and analyzing all the minutia of causation, as exemplified in the change from life to death, and death to life, until from the midst of this darkness a sudden light broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illustrated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries towards the same science, that I alone should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. Remember, I am not recording the vision of a madman. The sun does not more certainly shine in the heavens than that which I now affirm is true. Some miracle might have produced it, yet the stages of the discovery were distinct and probable. After days and nights of incredible labor and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. The astonishment which I had first experienced on this discovery soon gave place to delight and rapture. After so much time spent in painful labor, to arrive at once at the summit of my desires was the most gratifying consummation of my toils. But this discovery was so great and overwhelming that all the steps by which I had been progressively led to it were obliterated, and I beheld only the result. What had been the study and desire of the wisest men since the creation of the world was now within my grasp. Not that, like a magic scene, it all opened upon me at once. The information I had obtained was of a nature rather to direct my endeavors so soon as I should point them towards the object of my search than to exhibit that object already accomplished. I was like the Arabian, who had been buried with the dead and found a passage to life. 
aided only by one glimmering and seemingly ineffectual light. I see by your eagerness and the wonder and hope which your eyes express, my friend, that you expect to be informed of the secret which I am acquainted. That cannot be. Listen patiently until the end of my story, and you will easily perceive why I am reserved upon that subject. I will not lead you on, unguarded and ardent as I then was, to your destruction and infallible misery. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge, and how much happier that man is who believes his native town would be the world, than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. When I found so astonishing a power placed within my hands, I hesitated a long time concerning the manner in which I should employ it. Although I possessed the capacity of bestowing animation, yet to prepare a frame for the reception of it, with all its intricacies of fibres, muscles, and veins, still remained a work of inconceivable difficulty and labour. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself, or one of simpler organisation, but my imagination was too much exalted by my first success to permit me to doubt of my ability to give life to an animal as complex and wonderful as man. The materials at present within my command hardly appeared adequate to so arduous an undertaking, but I doubted not that I should ultimately succeed. I prepared myself for a multitude of reverses. My operations might be incessantly baffled, and at last my work be imperfect. Yet when I considered the improvement which every day takes place in science and mechanics, I was encouraged to hope my present attempts would at least lay the foundations of future success nor could I consider the magnitude and complexity of my plan as any argument of its impracticability. It was with these feelings that I began the creation of a human being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary to my first intention, to make the being of a gigantic stature, that is to say, about eight feet in height, and proportionably large. After having formed this determination, and having spent some months in successfully collecting and arranging my materials, I began. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards, like a hurricane in the first enthusiasm of success. Life and death appeared to me ideal bounds, which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. Pursuing these reflections, I thought that if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, I might in process of time, although I now found it impossible, renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. These thoughts supported my spirits, while I pursued my undertaking with unremitting ardour. My cheek had grown pale with study, and my person had become emaciated with confinement. Sometimes, on the very brink of certainty, I failed, yet still i clung to the hope which the next day or the next hour might realize one secret which i alone possessed was the hope to which i had dedicated myself and the moon gazed on my midnight labours while with unrelaxed and breathless eagerness i pursued nature to her hiding-places who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as i dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave or tortured the living animals to animate the lifeless clay my limbs now tremble, and my eyes swim with the remembrance. But then a resistless and almost frantic impulse urged me forward. I seemed to have lost all soul or sensation but for this one pursuit. It was indeed but a passing trance that only made me feel with renewed acuteness so soon as, the unnatural stimulus ceasing to operate, I had returned to my old habits. I collected bones from charnel-houses, and disturbed, with profane fingers, the tremendous secrets of the human frame. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all the other apartments by a gallery and staircase, I kept my workshop of filthy creation. My eyeballs were starting from their sockets in attending to the details of my employment. The dissecting-room and the slaughter-house furnished many of my materials and often did my human nature turn with loathing from my occupation. Whilst still urged on by an eagerness which perpetually increased, I brought my work near to a conclusion. The summer months passed while I was thus engaged, heart and soul, in one pursuit. It was a most beautiful season. Never did the fields bestow a more plentiful harvest, or the vines yield a more luxuriant vintage, but my eyes were insensible to the charms of nature. 
and the same feelings which made me neglect the scenes around me caused me also to forget those friends who were so many miles absent and whom i had not seen for so long a time i knew my silence disquieted them and i well remembered the words of my father i know that while you are pleased with yourself you will think of us with affection and we shall hear regularly from you you must pardon me if i regard any interruption in your correspondence as a proof that your other duties are equally neglected i knew well therefore that would be my father's feelings but i could not tear my thoughts from my employment loathsome in itself but which had taken an irresistible hold of my imagination i wished as it were to procrastinate all that related to my feelings of affection until the great object which swallowed up every habit of my nature should be completed i then thought that my father would be unjust if he ascribed my neglect to vice or faultiness on my part but i am now convinced that he was justified in conceiving that i should not be altogether free from blame a human being in perfection ought always to preserve a calm and peaceful mind and never to allow passion or a transitory desire to disturb his tranquillity i do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule if the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your affections and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy can possibly mix then that study is certainly unlawful that is to say not befitting the human mind if this rule were always observed if no man allowed any pursuit whatsoever to interfere with the tranquillity of his domestic affections greece had not been enslaved caesar would have spared his country america would have been discovered more gradually and the empires of mexico and peru had not been destroyed but i forget that i am moralizing in the most interesting part of my tale and your looks remind me to proceed my father made no reproach in his letters and only took notice of my silence by inquiring into my occupations more particularly than before winter spring and summer passed away during my labors but i did not watch the blossom or the expanding leaves sights which before always yielded me supreme delight so deeply was i engrossed in my occupation the leaves of that year had withered before my work drew near to a close and now every day showed me more plainly how well i had succeeded but my enthusiasm was checked by my anxiety and i appeared rather like one doomed by slavery to toil in the mines or any other unwholesome trade than an artist occupied by his favorite employment every night i was oppressed by a slow fever and i became nervous to a most painful degree the fall of a leaf startled me and i shunned my fellow-creatures as if i had been guilty of a crime sometimes i grew alarmed at the wreck i perceived that i had become the energy of my purpose alone sustained me my labors would soon end and i believed that exercise and amusement would then drive away incipient disease and i promised myself both of these when my creation should be complete. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me, that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning, the rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out, when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavoured to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful beautiful great god his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath his hair was of a lustrous black and flowing his teeth of a pearly whiteness but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set his shrivelled complexion and straight black lips the different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardour that far exceeded moderation, but now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. 
Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bedchamber, unable to compose my mind to sleep. At length lassitude succeeded to the tumult I had before endured, and I threw myself on the bed in my clothes, endeavouring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. But it was in vain. I slept, indeed, but I was disturbed by the wildest dreams. I thought I saw Elizabeth in the bloom of health, walking in the streets of Ingolstadt. Delighted and surprised, I embraced her, but as I imprinted the first kiss on her lips, they became livid with the hue of death. Her features appeared to change, and I thought that I held the corpse of my dead mother in my arms. A shroud enveloped her form, and I saw the grave-worms crawling in the folds of the flannel. I started from my sleep with horror. A cold dew covered my forehead, my teeth chattered, and every limb became convulsed. When, by the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the window-shutters, I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds, while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out, seeming to detain me, but I escaped and rushed downstairs. I took refuge in the courtyard belonging to the house which I inhabited, where I remained during the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching and fearing each sound as if it were to announce the approach of the demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life. Oh, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with animation could not be so hideous as that wretch. I had gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. I passed the night wretchedly. Sometimes my pulse beat so quickly and hardly that I felt the palpitation of every artery. At others I nearly sank to the ground through languor and extreme weakness. Mingled with this horror I felt the bitterness of disappointment. Dreams that had been my food and pleasant rest for so long a space were now become a hell to me and the change was so rapid, the overthrow so complete. Morning. Dismal and wet at length dawned and discovered to my sleepless and aching eyes the church of Ingolstadt, its white steeple and clock, which indicated the sixth hour. The porter opened the gates of the court, which had that night been my asylum, and I issued into the streets, pacing them with quick steps, as if I sought to avoid the wretch whom I feared every turning of the street would present to my view. I did not dare return to the apartment which I inhabited, but felt impelled to hurry on, although drenched by the rain which poured from a black and comfortless sky. I continued walking in this manner for some time, endeavouring by bodily exercise to ease the load that weighed upon my mind. I traversed the streets without any clear conception of where I was or what I was doing. My heart palpitated in the sickness of fear, and I hurried on with irregular steps, not daring to look about me like one who on a lonely road doth walk in fear and dread and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread continuing thus i came at length opposite to the inn at which the various diligences and carriages usually stopped here i paused i knew not why but i remained some minutes with my eyes fixed on a coach that was coming towards me from the other end of the street as I drew nearer I observed that it was the Swiss diligence. It stopped just where I was standing, and on the door being opened I perceived Henry Clerval, who, on seeing me, instantly sprung out. "'My dear Frankenstein!' exclaimed he. "'How glad I am to see you! How fortunate that you should be here at the very moment of my alighting!' Nothing could equal my delight on seeing Clerval. His presence brought back to my thoughts my father, Elizabeth, and all those scenes of home so dear to my recollection. I grasped his hand, and in a moment forgot my horror and misfortune. I felt suddenly, and for the first time during many months, calm and serene joy. I welcomed my friend, therefore, in the most cordial manner, and we walked towards my college. Clerval continued talking for some time about our mutual friends, and his own good fortune in being permitted to come to Ingolstadt. You may easily believe, said he, how great was the difficulty to persuade my father that all necessary knowledge was not comprised in the noble art of bookkeeping. 
and indeed i believe i left him incredulous to the last for his constant answer to my unwearied entreaties was the same as that of the dutch schoolmaster and the vicar of wakefield i have ten thousand florins a year without greek i eat heartily without greek but his affection for me at length overcame his dislike of learning and he has permitted me to undertake a voyage of discovery to the land of knowledge it gives me greatest delight to see you but tell me how you left my father brothers and elizabeth very well and very happy only a little uneasy that they hear from you so seldom by the by i mean to lecture you a little upon their account myself but my dear frankenstein continued he stopping short and gazing full at my face i did not before remark how very ill you appear so thin and pale you look as if you have been watching for several nights you have guessed right i have lately been so deeply engaged in one occupation that i have not allowed myself sufficient rest as you see but i hope i sincerely hope that all these employments are now at an end and that i am at length free i trembled excessively i could not endure to think of and far less to allude to the occurrences of the preceding night i walked with a quick pace and we soon arrived at my college i then reflected and the thought made me shiver that the creature whom i had left in my apartment might still be there alive and walking about i dreaded to behold this monster but i feared still more that henry should see him entreating him therefore to remain a few minutes at the bottom of the stairs i darted up towards my room my hand was already on the lock of the door before i recollected myself i then paused and a cold shivering came over me i threw the door forcibly open as children are accustomed to do when they expect a spectre to stand in waiting for them on the other side but nothing appeared i stepped fearfully in the apartment was empty and my bedroom was also freed from its hideous guest i could hardly believe that so great a good fortune could have befallen me but when i became assured that my enemy had indeed fled i clapped my hands for joy and ran down to clairval we ascended into my room and the servant presently brought breakfast but i was unable to contain myself it was not joy only that possessed me i felt my flesh tingle with excess of sensitiveness and my pulse beat rapidly i was unable to remain for a single instant in the same place i jumped over the chairs clapped my hands and laughed aloud clerval at first attributed my unusual spirits to joy on his arrival but when he observed me more attentively he saw a wildness in my eyes for which he could not account and my loud unrestrained heartless laughter frightened and astonished him my dear victor cried he what for god's sake is the matter do not laugh in that manner how ill are you what is the cause of all this do not ask me cried i putting my hands before my eyes for i thought i saw the dreaded spectre glide into the room he can tell oh save me save me i imagined that the monster seized me i struggled furiously and fell down in a fit poor clerval what must have been his feelings a meeting which he anticipated with such joy so strangely turned to bitterness but i was not the witness of his grief for i was lifeless and did not recover my senses for a long long time this was the commencement of a nervous fever which confined me for several months during all that time henry was my only nurse i afterwards learned that knowing my father's advanced age and unfitness for so long a journey and how wretched my sickness would make elizabeth he spared them this grief by concealing the extent of my disorder he knew that i could not have a more kind and attentive nurse than himself and firm in the hope he felt of my recovery he did not doubt that instead of doing harm he performed the kindest action that he could towards them but i was in reality very ill and surely nothing but the unbounded and unremitting attentions of my friend could have restored me to life the form of the monster on whom i had bestowed existence was forever before my eyes and i raved incessantly concerning him doubtless my words surprised henry he at first believed them to be the wanderings of my disturbed imagination but the pertinacity with which i continually recurred to the same subject persuaded him that my disorder indeed owed its origin to some uncommon and terrible event by very slow degrees and with frequent relapses that alarmed and grieved my friend i recovered i remember the first time i became capable of observing outward objects with any kind of pleasure 
I perceived that the fallen leaves had disappeared and that the young buds were shooting forth from the trees that shaded my window. It was a divine spring, and the season contributed greatly to my convalescence. I felt also sentiments of joy and affection revive in my bosom. My gloom disappeared, and in a short time I became as cheerful as before I was attacked by the fatal passion. "'Dearest Clerval,' exclaimed I, "'how kind, how very good you are to me. This whole winter, instead of being spent in study, as you promised yourself, has been consumed in my sick-room. How shall I ever repay you? I feel the greatest remorse for the disappointment of which I have been the occasion. But you will forgive me. You will repay me entirely if you do not discompose yourself, but get well as fast as you can. And since you appear in such good spirits, I may speak to you on one subject, may I not? I trembled. One subject, what could it be? Could he allude to an object on whom I dared not even think? Compose yourself, said Clerval, who observed my change of color. I will not mention it if it agitates you, but your father and cousin would be very happy if they received a letter from you in your own handwriting. They hardly know how ill you have been and are uneasy at your long silence. Is that all, my dear Henry? How could you suppose that my first thought would not fly towards those dear, dear friends whom I love, and who are so deserving of my love? If this is your present temper, my friend, you will perhaps be glad to see a letter that has been lying here some days for you. It is from your cousin, I believe. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus Clerval then put the following letter into my hands. It was from my own Elizabeth. My dearest cousin, you have been ill, very ill, and even the constant letters of dear kind Henry are not sufficient to reassure me on your account. You are forbidden to write, to hold a pen, yet one word from you, dear Victor, is necessary to calm our apprehensions. For a long time I have thought that each post would bring this line, and my persuasions have restrained my uncle from undertaking a journey to Ingolstadt. I have prevented his encountering the inconveniences and perhaps dangers of so long a journey. Yet how often have I regretted not being able to perform it myself? I figure to myself that the task of attending on your sickbed has devolved on some mercenary old nurse, who could never guess your wishes nor minister to them with the care and affection of your poor cousin. Yet that is over now. Clerval writes that indeed you are getting better. I eagerly hope that you will confirm this intelligence soon in your own handwriting. Get well, and return to us. You will find a happy, cheerful home and friends who love you dearly. Your father's health is vigorous, and he asks but to see you, but to be assured that you are well, and not a care will ever cloud his benevolent countenance. How pleased you would be to remark the improvement of our earnest! He is now sixteen and full of activity and spirit. He is desirous to be a true Swiss and to enter into foreign service. But we cannot part with him, at least until his elder brother returns to us. My uncle is not pleased with the idea of a military career in a distant country, but Ernest never had your powers of application. He looks upon study as an odious fetter. His time is spent in the open air, climbing the hills or rowing on the lake. I fear that he will become an idler unless we yield the point and permit him to enter on the profession which he has selected. Little alteration, except the growth of our dear children, has taken place since you left us. The blue lake and snow-clad mountains, they never change, and I think our placid home and our contented hearts are regulated by the same immutable laws. My trifling occupations take up my time and amuse me, and I am rewarded for any exertions by seeing none but happy, kind faces around me. Since you left us, but one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasion Justine Moritz entered our family? Probably you do not. I will relate her history, therefore, in a few words. Madame Moritz, her mother, was a widow with four children, of whom Justine was the third. This girl had always been the favorite of her father, but through a strange perversity her mother could not endure her, and after the death of Monsieur Moritz treated her very ill. My aunt observed this, and when Justine was twelve years of age, prevailed on her mother to allow her to live at our house. The republican institutions of our country have produced simpler and happier manners than those which prevail in the great monarchies that surround it. Hence, 
there is less distinction between the several classes of its inhabitants and the lower orders being neither so poor nor so despised their manners are more refined and moral a servant in geneva does not mean the same thing as a servant in france and england justine thus received in our family learned the duties of a servant a condition which in our fortunate country does not include the idea of ignorance and a sacrifice of the dignity of a human being justine you may remember was a great favorite of yours and i recollect you once remarked that if you were in an ill humor one glance from justine could dissipate it for the same reason that ariosto gives concerning the beauty of angelica she looked so frank-hearted and happy my aunt conceived a great attachment for her by which she was induced to give her an education superior to that which she had at first intended this benefit was fully repaid justine was the most grateful little creature in the world i do not mean that she made any professions i have never heard one pass her lips but you could see by her eyes that she almost adored her protectress although her disposition was gay and in many respects inconsiderate yet she paid the greatest attention to every gesture of my aunt she thought her the model of all excellence and endeavoured to imitate her phraseology and manners so that even now she often reminds me of her when my dearest aunt died every one was too much occupied in their own grief to notice poor justine who had attended her during her illness with the most anxious affection poor justine was very ill but other trials were reserved for her one by one her brothers and sister died and her mother with the exception of her neglected daughter was left childless the conscience of the woman was troubled she began to think that the deaths of her favourites were a judgment from heaven to chastise her partiality she was a roman catholic and i believe her confessor confirmed the idea which she had conceived accordingly a few months after your departure for ingolstadt justine was called home by her repentant mother poor girl she wept when she quitted our house she was much altered since the death of my aunt grief had given softness and a winning mildness to her manners which had before been remarkable for vivacity nor was her residence at her mother's house of a nature to restore her gaiety the poor woman was very vacillating in her repentance she sometimes begged justine to forgive her unkindness but much oftener accused her of having caused the deaths of her brothers and sister perpetual fretting at length threw madame moritz into a decline which at first increased her irritability but she is now at peace for ever she died on the first approach of cold weather at the beginning of this last winter justine has just returned to us and i assure you i love her tenderly she is very clever and gentle and extremely pretty as i mentioned before her mien and her expression continually remind me of my dear aunt i must say also a few words to you my dear cousin of little darling william i wish you could see him he is very tall of his age with sweet laughing blue eyes dark eyelashes and curling hair when he smiles two little dimples appear on each cheek which are rosy with health he has already had one or two little wives but louisa byron is his favourite a pretty little girl of five years of age now dear victor i dare say you wish to be indulged in a little gossip concerning the good people of geneva the pretty miss mansfield has already received the congratulatory visits on her approaching marriage with a young englishman john melbourne esq her ugly sister manon married monsieur duviard the rich banker last autumn your favourite schoolfellow louis manois has suffered several misfortunes since the departure of clerval from geneva but he has already recovered his spirits and is reported to be on the point of marrying a lively pretty frenchwoman madame tavernier she is a widow and much older than manoir but he is very much admired and a favourite with everybody i have ridden myself into better spirits dear cousin but my anxiety returns upon me as i conclude write dearest victor one line one word will be a blessing to us ten thousand thanks to henry for his kindness his affection and his many letters we are sincerely grateful adieu my dear cousin take care of yourself and i entreat you write Elizabeth Lovenza, Geneva, March 18th, at an undisclosed time in the 1700s. "'Dear, dear Elizabeth!' I exclaimed when I had read her letter. "'I will write instantly and relieve them from the anxiety they must feel.' I wrote, and this exertion greatly fatigued me, but my convalescence had commenced, and proceeded regularly. In another fortnight I was able to leave my chamber. 
One of my first duties on my recovery was to introduce Clerval to the several professors of the university. In doing this I underwent a kind of rough usage, ill-befitting the wounds that my mind had sustained. Ever since that fatal night, the end of my labours, and the beginning of my misfortunes, I had conceived a violent antipathy even to the name of natural philosophy. When I was otherwise quite restored to health, the sight of a chemical instrument would renew all the agony of my nervous symptoms. Henry saw this, and had removed all my apparatus from my view. He had also changed my apartment, for he perceived that I had acquired a dislike for the room which had previously been my laboratory. But these cares of Clerval were made of no avail when I visited the professors. Monsieur Waldman inflicted torture when he praised, with kindness and warmth, the astonishing progress I had made in the sciences. He soon perceived that I disliked the subject, but not guessing the real cause, he attributed my feelings to modesty, and changed the subject from my improvement to the science itself, with a desire, as I evidently saw, of drawing me out. What could I do? He meant to please, and he tormented me. I felt as if he had placed carefully, one by one, in my view those instruments which were to be afterwards used in putting me to a slow and cruel death. I writhed under his words, yet dared not exhibit the pain I felt. Clerval, whose eyes and feelings were always quick in discerning the sensations of others, declined the subject, alleging in excuse his total ignorance, and the conversation took a more general turn. I thanked my friend from my heart, but I did not speak. I saw plainly that he was surprised, but he never attempted to draw my secret from me, and although I loved him with a mixture of affection and reverence that knew no bounds, yet I could never persuade myself to confide in him that event which was so often present to my recollection, but which I feared the detail to another would only impress more deeply. Monsieur Kremp was not equally docile, and in my condition at that time, of almost insupportable sensitiveness, his harsh, blunt encomiums gave me even more pain than the benevolent approbation of Monsieur Waldman. "'Damn the fellow!' cried he. "'Why, Monsieur Clerval, I assure you he has outstripped us all. I stare if you please, but it is nevertheless true. A youngster who, but a few years ago, believed in Cornelius Agrippa as firmly as in the Gospel, has now set himself at the head of the university.' and if he is not soon pulled down, we shall all be out of countenance. Aye, aye, continued he, observing my face expressive of suffering. Monsieur Frankenstein is modest, an excellent quality in a young man. Young men should be diffident in themselves, you know, Monsieur Claval. I was myself when young, but that wears out in a very short time. Monsieur Kremp had now commenced an eulogy on himself, which happily turned the conversation from a subject that was so annoying to me. Clerval had never sympathized in my tastes for natural sciences, and his literary pursuits differed wholly from those which had occupied me. He came to the university with the design of making himself complete master of the Oriental languages, and thus he should open a field for the plan of life he had marked out for himself. Resolved to pursue no inglorious career, he turned his eyes toward the east, as affording scope for his spirit of enterprise. The Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit languages engaged his attention, and I was easily induced to enter on the same studies. Idleness had never been irksome to me, and now that I wished to fly from reflection and hated my former studies, I felt great relief in being the fellow pupil with my friend, and found not only instruction but consolation in the works of the Orientalists. I did not, like him, attempt a critical knowledge of their dialects, for I did not contemplate making any other use of them than temporary amusement. I read merely to understand their meaning, and they well repaid my labors. Their melancholy is soothing, and their joy elevating, to a degree I never experienced in studying the authors of any other country. When you read their writings, life appears to consist in a warm sun and a garden of roses in the smiles and frowns of a fair enemy, and the fire that consumes your own heart, how different from the manly and heroic poetry of Greece and Rome. Summer passed away in these occupations, and my return to Geneva was fixed for the latter end of autumn. But being delayed by several accidents, winter and snow arrived, the roads were deemed impassable, and my journey was retarded until the ensuing spring. 
I felt this delay very bitterly, for I longed to see my native town and my beloved friends. My return had only been delayed so long from an unwillingness to leave Clerval in a strange place before he had become acquainted with any of its inhabitants. The winter, however, was spent cheerfully, and although the spring was uncommonly late, when it came its beauty compensated for its dilatoriness. The month of May had already commenced, and I expected the letter daily which was to fix the date of my departure, when Henry proposed a pedestrian tour in the environs of Ingolstadt, that I might bid a personal farewell to the country I had so long inhabited. I acceded with pleasure to this proposition. I was fond of exercise, and Clerval had always been my favorite companion in the ramble of this nature that I had taken among the scenes of my native country. We passed a fortnight in these perambulations, and my health and spirits had long been restored, and they gained additional strength from the salubrious air I breathed, the natural incidents of our progress, and the conversation of my friend. Study had before secluded me from the intercourse of my fellow-creatures, and rendered me unsocial, but Clerval called forth the better feelings of my heart. He again taught me to love the aspect of nature, and the cheerful faces of children. Excellent friend, how sincerely you did love me, and endeavored to elevate my mind until it was on a level with your own. A selfish pursuit has cramped and narrowed me, until your gentleness and affection warmed and opened my senses. I became the same happy creature who, a few years ago, loved and beloved by all, had no sorrow or care when happy, inanimate nature had the power of bestowing on me the most delightful sensations. A serene sky and verdant fields filled me with ecstasy. The present season was indeed divine. The flowers of spring bloomed in the hedges, while those of summer were already in bud. I was undisturbed by thoughts which during the preceding year had pressed upon me, notwithstanding my endeavors to throw them off with an invincible burden. Henry rejoiced in my gaiety, and sincerely sympathized in my feelings. He exerted himself to amuse me, while he expressed the sensations that filled his soul. The resources of his mind on this occasion were truly astonishing. His conversation was full of imagination, and very often, in imitation of the Persian and Arabic writers, he invented tales of wonderful fancy and passion. At other times he repeated my favorite poems, or drew me out into arguments, which he supported with great ingenuity. We returned to our college on a Sunday afternoon. The peasants were dancing, and every one we met appeared gay and happy. My own spirits were high, and I bounded along with feelings of unbridled joy and hilarity. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus On my return I found the following letter from my father. My dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return to us, and I was at first tempted to write only a few lines, merely mentioning the day on which I should expect you, but that would be a cruel kindness, and I dare not do it. What would be your surprise, my son, when you expected a happy and glad welcome, to behold, on the contrary, tears and wretchedness? And how, Victor, can I relate our misfortune? Absence cannot have rendered you callous to our joys and griefs, and how shall I inflict pain on my long-absent son? I wish to prepare you for the woeful news, but I know it is impossible. Even now your eye skims over the page to seek the words which are to convey to you the horrible tidings. William is dead. That sweet child whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle yet so gay. Victor, he is murdered. I will not attempt to console you but will simply relate the circumstances of the transaction. Last Thursday, May 7th, I, my niece, and your two brothers went to walk in plain play. The evening was warm and serene, and we prolonged our walk farther than usual. It was already dusk before we thought of returning, and then we discovered that William and Ernest, who had gone on before, were not to be found. We accordingly rested on a seat until they should return. Presently Ernest came and inquired if we had seen his brother. He said that he had been playing with him, that William had run away to hide himself, and that he vainly sought for him, and afterwards waited for a long time, but that he did not return. This account rather alarmed us, and we continued to search for him until night fell, when Elizabeth conjectured that he might have returned to the house. He was not there. We returned again with torches, for I could not rest. 
when I thought that my sweet boy had lost himself and was exposed to all the damps and dews of night, Elizabeth also suffered extreme anguish. About five in the morning I discovered my lovely boy, whom the night before I had seen blooming and active in health, stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. The print of the murder's finger was on his neck. He was conveyed home, and the anguish that was visible in my countenance betrayed the secret to Elizabeth. She was very earnest to see the corpse. At first I attempted to prevent her, but she persisted, and entering the room where it lay, hastily examined the neck of the victim, and clasping her hands exclaimed, "'Oh, God, I have murdered my darling child!' She fainted, and was restored with extreme difficulty. When she again lived, it was only to weep and sigh. She told me that that same evening William had teased her to let him wear a very valuable miniature that she possessed of your mother. This picture is gone, and was doubtless the temptation which urged the murderer to the deed. We have no trace of him at present, although our exertions to discover him are unremitted, but they will not restore my beloved William. Come, dearest Victor, you alone can console Elizabeth. She weeps continually, and accuses herself unjustly as the cause of his death. Her words pierce my heart. We are all unhappy, but will not that be an additional motive for you, my son, to return and be our comforter? Your dear mother, alas, Victor, I now say, thank God she did not live to witness the cruel, miserable death of her youngest darling. Come, Victor, not brooding thoughts of vengeance against the assassin, but with feelings of peace and gentleness that will heal instead of festering the wounds of our minds. And to the house of mourning, my friend, but with kindness and affection for those who love you, and not with hatred for your enemies. Your affectionate and afflicted father, Alphonse Frankenstein Geneva, May 12th, at an undisclosed time in the 1700s Clerval, who had watched my countenance as I read this letter, was surprised to observe the despair that succeeded the joy I at first expressed on receiving new from my friends. I threw the letter on the table and covered my face with my hands. "'My dear Frankenstein!' exclaimed Henry when he perceived me weep with bitterness. "'Are you always to be unhappy? My dear friend, what has happened?' I motioned him to take up the letter, while I walked up and down the room in the extremest agitation. Tears also gushed from the eyes of Clerval as he read the account of my misfortune. "'I can offer you no consolation, my friend,' said he. "'Your disaster is irreparable. What do you intend to do?' "'To go instantly to Geneva. Come with me, Henry, to order the horses.' During our walk Clerval endeavoured to say a few words of consolation. He could only express his heartfelt sympathy. "'Poor William,' said he, "'dear, lovely child, he now sleeps with his angel mother, who that had seen him bright and joyous in his young beauty, but must weep over his untimely loss. To die so miserably, to feel the murderer's grasp, how much more a murder that could destroy radiant innocence! Poor little fellow! Only one consolation have we. His friends mourn and weep, but he is at rest.' The pang is over. His sufferings are at an end forever. A sod covers his gentle form, and he knows no pain. He can no longer be a subject for pity. We must reserve that for his miserable survivors. Clerval spoke thus, and we hurried through the streets. The words impressed themselves on my mind, and I remembered them afterwards in solitude. But now, as soon as the horses arrived, I hurried into the cabriolet, and bade farewell to my friend. My journey was very melancholy. At first I wished to hurry on, for I longed to console and sympathize with my loved and sorrowing friends. But when I drew near my native town, I slackened my progress. I could hardly sustain the multitude of feelings that crowded into my mind. I passed through scenes familiar to my youth, but which I had not seen for nearly six years. How altered everything might be during that time! One sudden and desolating change had taken place, but a thousand little circumstances might have by degrees worked other alterations, which, although they were done more tranquilly, might not be the less decisive. Fear overcame me. I dared no advance, dreading a thousand nameless evils that made me tremble, although I was unable to define them. I remained two days at Lausanne in this painful state of mind. I contemplated the lake. The waters were placid. All around was calm and the snowy mountains, palaces of nature, were not changed. By degrees the calm and heavenly scene restored me, and I continued my journey towards Geneva. 
The road ran by the side of the lake, which became narrower as I approached my native town. I discovered more distinctly the black sides of Jura and the bright summit of Mont Blanc. I wept like a child. Dear mountains, my own beautiful lake, how do you welcome your wanderer? Your summits are clear, the sky and lake are blue and placid. Is this to prognosticate peace, or to mock at my unhappiness? I fear, my friend, that I shall render myself tedious by dwelling on these preliminary circumstances, but they were days of comparative happiness, and I think of them with pleasure. My country, my beloved country, who but a native can tell the delight I took in again, beholding the streams, thy mountains, and more than all, thy lovely lake. Yet as I drew nearer home, grief and fear again overcame me. Night also closed around, and when I could hardly see the dark mountains, I felt still more gloomily. The picture appeared a vast and dim scene of evil, and I foresaw obscurely that I was destined to become the most wretched of human beings. Alas! I prophesied truly and failed only in one single circumstance, that in all the misery I imagined and dreaded, I did not conceive the hundredth part of the anguish I was destined to endure. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to pass the night at Secheron, a village at the distance of half a league from the city. The sky was serene, and as I was unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. As I could not pass through the town, I was obliged to cross the lake in a boat to arrive at Plain Palais. During this short voyage, I saw the lightning playing on the summit of Mont Blanc, in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared to approach rapidly, and on landing I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced, the heavens were clouded, and I soon felt rain coming slowly in large drops, but its violence quickly increased. I quitted my seat and walked on, although the darkness and storm increased every minute, and the thunder burst with terrific crash over my head. It was echoed from Salive, the Juras, and the Alps of Savoy. Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. Then for an instant everything seemed of a pitchy darkness, until the eye recovered itself from the preceding flash. The storm, as is often the case in Switzerland, appeared at once in various parts of the heavens. The most violent storm hung exactly north of the town over the part of the lake which lies between the promontory of Belrive and the village of Copet. Another storm enlightened Jura with faint flashes, and another darkened and sometimes disclosed the mole, a peak mountain to the east of the lake. While I watched the tempest, so beautiful and yet terrific, I wandered on with a hasty step. This noble war in the sky elevated my spirits. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, "'William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this is thy dirge.' As I said these words, I perceived, in the gloom, a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object, and discovered its shape plainly to me its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspect more hideous than belongs to humanity instantly informed me that it was the wretch the filthy demon to whom i had given life what did he there could he be i shuddered at the conception the murderer of my brother no sooner did the idea cross my imagination than i became convinced of its truth my teeth chattered and i was forced to lean against a tree for support the figure passed me quickly and i lost it in the gloom Nothing in human shape could have destroyed the fair child. He was the murderer. I could not doubt it. The mere presence of the idea was an irresistible proof of the fact. I thought of pursuing the devil, but it would have been in vain, for another flash discovered him to me hanging among the rocks of the nearly perpendicular ascent to Mont Salève, a hill that bounds Plain Palais on the south. He soon reached the summit and disappeared. I remained motionless. The thunder ceased, but the rain still continued, and the scene was enveloped in an impenetrable darkness. I revolved in my mind the events which I had until now sought to forget, the whole train of my progress toward the creation, the appearance of the works of my own hands at my bedside, its departure. Two years had now nearly elapsed since the night on which he first received life, and was this his first crime? Alas! I had turned loose into the world a depraved wretch, whose delight was in carnage and misery. Had he not murdered my brother? 
No one can conceive the anguish I suffered during the remainder of the night, which I spent cold and wet in the open air. But I did not feel the inconvenience of the weather. My imagination was busy in scenes of evil and despair. I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind, and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he had now done. Nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit led loose from the grave, and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Day dawned, and I directed my steps toward the town. The gates were open, and I hastened to my father's house. My first thought was to discover what I knew of the murderer, and cause instant pursuit to be made, but I paused when I reflected on the story that I had to tell. A being whom I myself had formed, and endued with life, had met me at midnight among the precipices of an inaccessible mountain. I remembered also the nervous fever with which I had been seized just at the time that I dated my creation, and which would give an air of delirium to a tale otherwise so utterly improbable. I well knew that if any other had communicated such a relation to me, I should have looked upon it as the ravings of insanity. Besides, the strange nature of the animal would elude all pursuit, even if I were so far credited as to persuade my relatives to commence it. And then, of what use would be pursuit? Who could arrest a creature capable of scaling the overhanging sides of Mont Salève? These reflections determined me, and I resolved to remain silent. It was about five in the morning when I entered my father's house. I told the servants not to disturb the family, and went into the library to attend their usual hour of rising. Six years had elapsed, passed in a dream but for one indelible trace, and I stood in the same place where I had last embraced my father before my departure for Ingolstadt. Beloved and venerable parent, he still remained to me. I gazed on the picture of my mother which stood over the mantelpiece. It was an historical subject, painted at my father's desire, and represented Caroline Beaufort in an agony of despair, kneeling by the coffin of her dead father. Her garb was rustic and her cheek pale, but there was an air of dignity and beauty that hardly permitted the sentiment of pity. Below this picture was a miniature of William, and my tears flowed when I looked upon it. While I was thus engaged, Ernest entered. He had heard me arrive and hastened to welcome me. "'Welcome, my dearest Victor,' said he. "'Oh, I wish you had come three months ago, and then you would have found us all joyous and delighted. You come to us now to share a misery which nothing can alleviate, yet your presence will, I hope, revive our father, who seems sinking under his misfortune, and your persuasions will induce poor Elizabeth to cease her vain and tormenting self-accusations. Poor William, he was our darling and our pride.' Tears unrestrained fell from my brother's eyes. A sense of mortal agony crept over my frame. Before I had only imagined the wretchedness of my desolated home, the reality came on me as a new and a not less terrible disaster. I tried to calm Ernest. I inquired more minutely concerning my father, and here I named my cousin. "'She most of all,' said Ernest, "'requires consolation. She accused herself of having caused the death of my brother, and that made her very wretched.' But since the murderer has been discovered— The murderer discovered? Good God, how can that be? Who could attempt to pursue him? It is impossible. One might as well try to overtake the winds, or confine a mountain stream with a straw. I saw him, too. He was free last night. I do not know what you mean, replied my brother, in accents of wonder. But to us the discovery we have made completes our misery. No one would believe it at first, and even now Elizabeth will not be convinced notwithstanding all the evidence. Indeed, who would credit that Justine Moritz, who was so amiable and fond of all the family, could suddenly become so capable of so frightful, so appalling a crime? Justine Moritz? Poor, poor girl, is she the accused? But it is wrongfully. Everyone knows that. No one believes it, surely, Ernest. No one did at first, but several circumstances came out that have almost forced conviction upon us and her own behaviour has been so confused as to add to the evidence of facts a weight that, I fear, leaves no hope for doubt. But she will be tried to-day, and you will then hear all. He then related that, the morning on which the murder of poor William had been discovered, Justine had been taken ill and confined to her bed for several days. During this interval, 
one of the servants happening to examine the apparel she had worn on the night of the murder had discovered in her pocket the picture of my mother which had been judged to be the temptation of the murder the servant instantly showed it to one of the others who without saying a word to any of the family went to a magistrate and upon their deposition justine was apprehended on being charged with the fact the poor girl confirmed the suspicion in a great measure by her extreme confusion of manner this was a strange tale but it did not shake my faith and i replied earnestly you are all mistaken i know the murderer justine poor good justine is innocent at that instant my father entered i saw unhappiness deeply impressed on his countenance but he endeavoured to welcome me cheerfully and after we had exchanged our mournful greeting would have introduced some other topic than that of our disaster had not ernest exclaimed good god papa victor says that he knows who was the murderer of poor william we do also unfortunately replied my father for indeed i had rather have been for ever ignorant than have discovered so much depravity and ungratitude in one i valued so highly my dear father you are mistaken justine is innocent if she is god forbid that she should suffer as guilty she is to be tried to-day and i hope i sincerely hope that she will be acquitted this speech calmed me i was firmly convinced in my own mind that justine and indeed every human being was guiltless of this murder i had no fear therefore that any circumstantial evidence could be brought forward strong enough to convict her my tale was not one to announce publicly its astounding horror would be looked upon as madness by the vulgar did any one indeed exist except i the creator who would believe unless his senses convinced him in the existence of the living monument of presumption and rash ignorance which i had let loose upon the world we were soon joined by elizabeth time had altered her since i last beheld her it had endowed her with loveliness surpassing the beauty of her childish years there was the same candour the same vivacity but it was allied to an expression more full of sensibility and intellect she welcomed me with the greatest affection your arrival my dear cousin said she fills me with hope you perhaps will find some means to justify my poor guiltless justine alas who is safe if she be convicted of crime i rely on her innocence as certainly as i do upon my own our misfortune is doubly hard to us we have not only lost that lovely darling boy but this poor girl whom i sincerely love is to be torn away by even a worse fate if she is condemned I never shall know joy more. But she will not, I am sure she will not. And then I shall be happy again, even after the sad death of my little William. She is innocent, my Elizabeth, said I, and that shall be proved. Fear nothing, but let your spirits be cheered by the assurance of her acquittal. How kind and generous you are! Everyone else believes in her guilt, and that made me wretched, for I knew that it was impossible and to see every one else prejudiced in so deadly a manner rendered me hopeless and despairing she wept dearest niece said my father dry your tears if she is as you believe innocent rely on the justice of our laws and the activity with which i shall prevent the slightest shadow of partiality End of chapter seven